Hello, in this video we're going to look at Poisson regression with the canonical link. And I'm calling this part one because the equations that we derive in this video we're going to copy exactly into R and run the iteratively reweighted least squares from scratch and then compare it with the built-in function in R, the GLM function. I have two background videos and on middle of page two we're going to follow BV1 exactly and then of course we're going to make reference to the Poisson distribution throughout and so BV2 would be a good one to read and now I'm going to first spend the page to kind of show you the way I think about Poisson regression and then we'll use the machinery of generalized linear models to solve it and use iteratively reweighted least squares regression so here's the Poisson density and oh, I, density might not be the right word. I don't think it's incorrect, but I probably should say Poisson density of the discrete type because you can have a density of continuous type. And then, of course, to lose the ambiguity, it's probably better to just say a probability mass function. But I, I have density, and that's a, probably a bad habit that I have. So the density density or probably mass function of a Poisson is this and uh, where lambda is the parameter it's strictly positive and y you can think of it as a, a count variable it's the, we're counting the number of events per unit of time and the expected value and the variance equal and so if you're going to do a Poisson regression you should calculate the mean and the variance of y and, it, and see if they're at least in the same ballpark before you do this uh, approach. And, uh, oh, and why, you know, it's counted the, as the number of events per unit of time. And so, and I put quotes there because on page two, we're going to look at what's called an offset. And, and that has to deal with the unit of time. And so, we're, you know, it's the number of events over the same unit of time. And we're going to let x, and this is a vector, be the covariates that may influence y. And then if we let mu, the mean, be, of course, the expected value of y, which we know in the Poisson case is lambda. And well, lambda has to be positive. And so if, if these covariates influence y, so we think of them as influencing the mean or the average number of counts for that patient or for this set of covariates. And since this can be negative or positive, that doesn't really fit into lambda, which has to be positive. So we exponentiate it to make it always be positive. And so we use this function to, to keep it positive. And, and I, I say A to I here represents this, right? Because this is technically just a number. It's the dot product of two vectors or the vector product. And so we could just write a number and A to I is the common notation. Well, it turns out that exponentiating this ends up being what's called the uh, canonical link, right? If we take the log of both sides, then the log of this mean, right, is this linear combination. So if we think about our parameter as this, then we put that into the the uh, probably mass function. So wherever there is a lambda, we stick in this exponential. So right here, and then e to the lambda, so we put it there, and it's divided by yi um, factorial. Now this is for an individual, so if we look at the joint probably mass function, so this is a vector now, and since they're all independent, it's the product of these. And then it's, you know, you take the product of this, which you get this right here. Now, this is the joint probability mass function, but it can also be thought as the likelihood. You just kind of rethink how you think about y and the betas. Now you let betas be a variable and the y's be constant, you know, our data be constant. And then we can uh, find the log likelihood, which is this. So if you take the log, so that can go in, then you take the log of this product, so some of the logs but then the log and the e cancel and we get this um, e cancels we get the exponent and then the minus we get that 
Um, and this is it. So now if we maximize L in terms of beta, then we, we can come up with estimates for our, our betas, and that's what we do. Um, and, th and that's kind of how I think about Poisson regression. Um, but first I want to talk about an, an offset, which is sometimes uh, confusing for, for some. And then I want to jump right into G GLM structure. So an offset is, is this. So each observation, yi, is observed for a different period of time, ti, right? So remember yi, we're counting things. But if, you, if one observation is over five years and the other is over two years, then the counts really aren't comparable because it's over different periods of time. So what we do is we divide the yi by ti. And then that changes the variable to events per unit of time. It puts them over the same measure of time. So if we look at this, so now let's look at the expected value of this new variable. And we're still going to say that it equals this um, linear combination. So it's exponentiate of these covariates. And of course, you can think about that as eta. But the t is constant, so it can come out of this expectation, and then we're still left with this. Now, if we take the log of both sides, we get this, right? The log of a, a division is a minus. Now, we can take that to the other side, and we get this, right? Well, this piece right here is what's called an offset. And... And so this is the, the measure of time that we have for each variable. And so when you look at the GLM built-in function, it, this is what's called an offset. So you'd say offset, log, and then use this time variable. But really, this is still the linear combination, right? So this is a linear combination, beta 0, x1, beta 1, all the way to xk, beta k. And then we just assume this beta parameter, if that's what you want to call it, is one in term in front of this term. Well that's 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 what's called an offset. So if we exponentiate here and here, so this goes back to the the mean and then this is all exponentiated, but we can separate that and this and we get this. And then of course the mean is our lambda i. So we're now modeling this in place of lambda i and you can go through the same thing that we did on page one. Well, now let's jump into the GLM structure. So our distribution function is this, and this is in exponential form. And, and so look at BV2 to understand this. And this piece right here is called the log partition. And we g generically call that function B. So B of theta is e to the theta i. And then this has some nice properties that if we take the derivative, it's the mean of y, or our sufficient statistic here. So now we can find the joint, dis the joint distribution, and then we take the log likelihood of it, and then we get this, right? And so I'm gonna skip a few steps because if you've made it this far, you understand that, that piece of it. And we're gonna use the link function um, here, so it's some function of our mean is this linear combination. And then we're assuming this linear combination is theta, our, our canonical parameter, hence the canonical link. Now, um, here we're, you, you know, we're using our link function, which is the log of x. And that also implies that our inverse link function is the exponential of x. And... To me, this makes total sense. If you look at BV2 and understand what that piece is right there, that's actually the log of lambda. And so we're letting the log of lambda be this. So if we exponentiate both sides, then we get e to this linear combination is lambda, which is actually the same thing that we were saying on page one. But I'll let you uh, BV2 to, uh, to kind of delve into that a little deeper. Now we need to 
start taking partial derivatives because we want to maximize this likelihood in terms of betas. But notice there's no betas here. There's only um, uh, thetas. So first let's take the partial of Li, and this is, we're going to do one of them and then we'll sum them later. So the partial of Li with respect to theta i is, um, we get, y, this is constant, goes away, we get yi, and then we take the derivative with respect to theta i, we get e to the, the theta i. Now, let's go to page 3. The derivative of eta i with respect to beta j is this, and then there, the, we take the coefficient in front of beta j, which is xij, and then here, notice that the mean it was of this Poisson was uh, lambda i, and if you watch BV2, that's the derivative of the log partition, and the variance of yi, which we know is lambda i, and this is a function of the mean, right? And that's what they generically call the variance function in the GLM structure. And we also know by BV2 that that's the second derivative of our log partition. So when we take the partial of theta i with respect to mu, right? And since uh, b is invertible, then we can, we can think of it as 1 over this reciprocal of partial of mu i with respect to theta i. Then that's easier. So it's just a second derivative of our log partition, which is actually the variance function, which we know as lambda. So it's one over lambda. Uh, step or number four, we want to find the partial of mu i with respect to eta i. So we know our link, uh, our link function of our mean is this linear combination, but we know the link is the log of e. So that means mu i, if you back solve for mu i, that is the, the inverse of our link function, which we know our inverse function is the exponentiation of it. So the derivative of this with respect to a to i is the derivative of this, which is you get e to the uh, a to i back. Now the reason we do to all these partials, because ultimately we want this, we want to take the partial of our log likelihood in terms of beta j. Well this one's easy because the, the partial or the likelihood is in terms of theta i. So we take the partial in terms of theta. And here eta is a linear combination of the betas. So we can take this partial with respect to beta j. And then we just have to find the pieces that, that make the, the cancellation or this this daisy chain of partial derivatives equal to what we want. And this this is what it is. Now we plug in each of these pieces into, you know, and we get this. We set it equal to zero and solve for theta. Now remember this is for one of the sum, one piece of that sum. So there's actually n equations here that we have to all simultaneously solve uh, to, to solve for the betas. Now the steps that we're going to follow and again, we're following uh, the background video one exactly. Is st first step one is we're going to estimate beta, and we do we just set it to zero, and and that way it works out. It, it it's easier that way. Step two is then then we start estimating the pieces that we need. So we need a to i, which is the this vector product, and then once we know a to, then we can take the inverse uh, it inverse link function which is exponentiate and we get the mean and then once we know the mean then we can plug it into this equation and come up with an estimate of z and then once we know uh, once you know we can estimate a to i which is our weight function and then we step three and again we're following the, BV1, the background video one, exactly. So for if you want more details of that, you can go back to that video. So then our weighted least squares regression of our beta estimate becomes this, xwx inverse xwz. Then once we come up with this estimate for beta, we actually go back to step two and then re-plug it in and then solve 
and then plug it in here, weighted least squares regression, and we just keep doing this. So we just keep repeating steps two and three until we get convergence, or each successive beta estimate is closer and closer to each other. Okay, well that's all I have for this video. In the next video, we're going to plug these equations exactly into R and run the iteratively reweighted least squares regression and then compare it with the built-in function in R. And to no surprise, they match. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. I sure did. Uh, please like it and subscribe so you don't miss the next one. Thanks. Bye.